Uh, hey everyone, I'm Nirpam from the Underwater Photography Guide and Blue Water Photo and Travel. Uh, today we are talking about Dumaguete, Philippines. Um, this is being live streamed, so for those of you that are joining us on Facebook, go ahead and uh, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments, we'll answer them. Uh, now, if you are joining us on Zoom, go ahead and leave any uh, comments or questions in the chat box below. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Marty Snyderman. Uh, who represents uh, Atlantis in Zubagetti, uh, and he's also going to be leading a trip for us uh, with Mark Strickland, um, and they are definitely the Zubagetti experts. Hi, everyone. Hi, all. I, I'm, are you saying you just handed that off to me, Norpon? I just handed that off to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to share, I'm going to say hi, everybody. Thanks for being here, and I'm going to share my screen, and you should at this time, see my screen. Is that is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and so if I do that, I'm going to also say, I know Neuropalm welcomed everyone. I am as well. And I am, I am doing this part of the presentation because I work with the Atlantis Resorts. Um, I am our photography ambassador, although I have yet to find somebody who will call me Mr. Ambassador <laughs> other than my mother. But mom thinks all you guys ought to do that. Um, <laughs> But I've worked with Atlantis for uh, about six or eight years. It, COVID getting in the middle of it kind of screws up my math. But this tonight, the presentation is on the resort in Dumaguete, where Mark and I are going to be leading a photo workshop um, this summer. So the first thing I want to say is that, you know, when I talk to people about the Philippines, people generally have an idea where the Philippines are. They're kind of way out there somewhere. And so... What I want to do is just tell you that the Philippines are um, actually north of the equator. Manila, which you can, I think, and uh, you know what, if I stop this, if I can find this for just a second. So Manila is right here. I think everybody can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Yeah, okay. Yep. So there's Manila, and it is 14 degrees north of the equator. So you're in the northern hemisphere. It is east of Vietnam in the South China Sea, north of Malaysia and Indonesia, south of Taiwan. Now, when you say that's where the Philippines are, the Philippines is a nation of 7,107 islands. I think 2,000 of them are occupied. Uh, only 500 of them are as large as a square kilometer. So yeah, uh, when you go to the Philippines, it's not exactly like going to the United States, but it is a, but it is a big place. And I'm going to stop this just one more time uh, and say that I just want to show you where Dumaguete, whoopsie, did I do that? I did. Just say, uh, where Dumaguete is is, so here's Manila, and here's where you're going to, to Dumaguete. It's Negros Oriental. And at this distance is about a one hour and five minute flight from Manila. So it's, a, it's another airplane flight. You'll fly internationally into Manila, take a domestic flight down to, to Dumaguete. And I did that again, and I meant to share my screen. And I am. So the, the thing that we really love about the Philippines is that it's located within that area of the world that's known as the Coral Triangle. It's an area that's bounded by Malaysia and Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Timor-Leste, um, and it is thought to be the center of marine biodiversity in the world. There are over 600 species of hard corals, uh, and of course those reef building corals supply food and habitat for, for countless animals. Six of the world's seven or six of the world's eight, depending on the taxonomy, the, which system of classification you adhere to, if you adhere to such a thing. Uh, six of the world's uh, species of sea turtles can be found within the coral triangle. And this is ridiculous, but it's more than 2000 species of fishes. By comparison, the Caribbean has about 750 species. I won't claim that you're gonna see all 2000 in uh, in our trip but you're gonna it's not just the numbers it's some of them are just so great looking these guys this is a ornate ghost pipe fish on the top uh and one of my well I, I don't know that it's even more favorite than an ornate ghost pipe fish but it's a paddle flap scorpion fish in the <laughs> bottom right i just don't see how mother nature does much better than this no, she um, 
Top left is a devil scorpion fish or spiny devil fish, a couple of common names, and a painted frogfish. The, the, there are, I don't know, six or seven species of frogfish that we see sometimes. Um, and uh, these are, there are 13 species in the world of wrasses called flasher wrasse. You have to say that really slowly and you have to be careful when you say flasher wrasse, but <laughs> they are spectacular <laughs> fish. And these are the males in a display. And the males, just they, they're not as colorful and all of a sudden they erect their fins and spread their fins and they're just spectacular. And they do that to, they, to kind of corral their harem and to ward off uh, other males. It's kind of a, a chest thumping at the bar on Saturday night. Uh, but spectacular fish. I, I suppose I would say it's hard not to be a nudibranch enthusiast if you're a diver. And if you are, it's hard not to be a Philippines enthusiast because there's just tons of nudibranchs. These are just a couple of dorids, uh, just some other some of the species that we might see. Whoa. Whoops, did I whoa? Uh, uh, there, uh, so the same thing is true with uh, moray eels. Lots of different species of eels. It's a fimbriated moray on your left, a snowflake moray on the right, uh, a pair of white-eyed morays, and a blue ribbon. This is a blue ribbon eel. One of the things that's really different about the, the way we dive is in so many places, you anchor a boat or you tie off to a mooring, you get in the water and you swim as fast as you can to the closest reef. And at Dumaguete, it's not all about muck diving, but you don't necessarily go to the reef. You look in the, so the areas of the, of the bottom that are soft bottom, where there's sand or rubble. And when you first see them, when you first look over that expanse, it looks like this sand flat. And you may think to yourself, oh, my God, these people talk me into coming here to look at this empty sand. And then you start looking. And there's all these life forms in every place, not every place, I suppose that's an exaggeration, but so many places where there's a structure of any kind, whether it's uh, uh, just a, a, a soft coral or just a little bitty coral head, anything, you go look and you find life forms. Um, we dive a, every night. There is a night dive that's offered. Um, we often see these are, are long fin or big fin squid. Um, and this, this is a stargazer. It's a fish that buries itself in the sand. I've had some of my friends refer to them as Halloween fish, and I think it's kind of an appropriate name. But they bury in the sand. Um, this guy on the top left is kind of uncovered, but reburying. And they just uh, uh, leap out of the sand, if you will, and um, surprise unsuspecting for its prey that just swims too near. And one of the things that's different about giving these presentations on Zoom, I don't see anybody's faces and I don't see, I'm not seeing the audience. So if anybody has a question, um, please, please feel free to, to ask. Um, and I think, what are they to type it in, Nir Nirpom, in the, in the chat? Yeah, you can type it in the chat or unmute yourself and ask, you know, ask away. Oh, yeah. So pl please do. Please don't hesitate to do this. Um, because I think Neuropalm and, and Tim and Mark have heard this presentation. So uh, uh, Actually, other animals we often see at night. This is so cool. Again, you go over that sand or that soft bottom area um, in the day and you never see a box crab. But it, these animals are, are buried within the sand during the day and they come up out of the sand at night. It's like the bottom comes alive. It's not true of all the crustaceans. Oh. This is a soft coral crab that you see on, on the soft corals, uh, mm -hmm. on some of the soft corals. They're about an inch tall. Um, you often see the second one after the guide has pointed out the first one. It's mm -hmm. likely to become a lot easier to find. And I know in this part of the world, uh, you know, the, the, one of the things that's cool is the guides are diving this area all the time. And so they know where these animals are and they have a pretty good idea when they've moved a little bit so that you and I, if we went out there for the first time, we might not see a lot of these animals, but the guides will be able to point them out and then they, they're just great subjects. Uh, Marty, I do have one question on Facebook. Uh, on. Which is, do you recommend a muck stick when diving here? 
Um, I use one. Um, I think one, one of the things, yeah, I think there's no reason not to bring one. You want to be careful. Certainly, we don't use it to prod animals. Um, it's not for that, but it will help you keep off the bottom or keep off the reef. Um, and I think that's the reason to, to use it. it it's tempting to, for people to want to move animals. We try to, and we certainly don't encourage that. Um, but yeah, I'd, br I'd bring one. And w one, of the, one of the things we've heard it since the day we started taking diving classes, but having buoyancy control and going really slow and looking is a key to finding these animals. Um, if you swim fast, you'll swim over these animals, but you wanna get down as low as you can to the bottom without dragging on the bottom and you look for aberrations in the soft bottom. And then it's not necessarily true of an animal like this bug-eyed squat lobster that you would see in the reef community. So it's not all about tiny animals. You'll see big animals like uh, stingrays and remoras, but you're less likely to take a wide angle lens at the resort itself, unless we go and dive the town pier, which Mark, I don't think they had, the pier was open to us the last time you were there, but it's Correct. a spectacular pier. It is covered with soft corals and with uh, damselfish nests and nudibranchs and lionfish. It, it's one of the best piers I've ever dived. So uh, we'll get a chance to do that. So there's all the kind of muck diving or soft bottom and a little bit of reef diving at the resort, but the trip is not all about muck diving. So if you board this boat or one like it, about an hour away is Apo Island. And we'll dive over there, um, Apo at least once and with an option to, to do more, I think, but probably go one time and do a three dives. And Apo is more like what you think of as a typical South Pacific or Indo-Pacific reef. It's sheer walls, it's hard corals, it's sponges, there's swarming schools of anthias over crinoids and cup corals. And it's, it, it feels like you're kind of going to a very different environment than you were at the resort. You'll see certainly some similar, similar fishes or the exact same species, but you certainly see a different environment and more, uh, more animals. Hey, Marty. Animals. Yes. Are these your photographs? These are. Okay, just, just wondering. <laughs> yeah, if you see a flaw, just uh, put it in the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. And you know what, who's, who is speaking up right now? Uh, this is Jody Kahn. Jody, how are you? I thank you for the, thanks for the question. I'm good, thanks. So this is pretty typical of one of the drops uh, at, at uh, Apo. And you'll see, likely to see a yellow belly uh, sea crate. It's not a sea snake. They're, you think they're closely related just because they look, they're, they're actually a little more distantly related than you might suspect. But sea crates leave the uh, water to uh, lay eggs and mate. Uh, and sometimes just to rest. But you'll see these guys at the island. You may see them at the resorts. Um, and you'll also, at the islands, of course, if you look in the sea fans, you'll see the same kind of life, this like a long-nosed hawkfish. Um, and it is, I know this is not a word, but it's a fact. It is one of the turtliest places on the planet. <laughs> um, green turtles and hawksbills. Um, and it, it's hard to imagine going to Apo Island and, and not having a good opportunity to, to see and photograph a turtle. Um, so I have a question here, which is, uh, is it mostly near volcanic islands? So I guess is Apo Island volcanic and the surrounding area? Remember when I said I didn't know, if I didn't know the answer to all these questions, I was just going to leave? Well, I'm going <laughs> to stick around, but I don't know the answer to that. But I think Mark, who took geology class yeah. when I was sleeping in college, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't either. Uh, it, it does not have the look of one of those typical volcanic cinder cone type islands, but the, the region in general is highly volcanic. So yeah, it's certainly related sorry. to volcanism. Don't mean to step on you there, Mark. Uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, the whole area is part of the ring of fire. So uh, the, there's a lot of volcanic activity. I don't know the particular islands. This is another, this is one of my just fun experiences at, at Apo Island. This is a pharaoh cuttlefish. It's I don't know, a foot, foot and a half long. It's a big animal. 
And I saw this animal. She, she's a she, but I didn't know it at the time. And I, I just knew something was a little different. I just kind of backed off and watched. And she left this ledge, swam 15 or 20 feet, and is now planting her egg in the coral. Right. And you can see the egg in, in her, uh, right at the, the edge of the coral, the finger of the corals. And she'd go back under that same ledge where she was before. And after yes. five or six minutes, come back out and plant another egg. And um, this is one of the cuttlefish that was hatching uh, this was actually photographed at the resort, but we'll see this. There's cuttlefish eggs around, and it's just a cool moment. Baby cuttlefish. Oh, shit. Question? No. Um, not, one of the other activities that's really cool that's not at the resort is we'll have a chance to go to, to Oslob to dive or snorkel with, I should say, to swim with whale sharks. We'll probably do that on the next to the last day or the day of the trip before we leave um, because we can, it won't interfere with our flight time. But Oslob is one of those communities in the world that has built, its whole structure depends on tourism and having fishermen feed whale sharks. It's uh, pretty organized. It's a, a day where you get up, have a very early breakfast and travel by kind of by, by a ferry and try a uh, car, a van and golf carts and, and little boats. And then you're out amongst the whale sharks and they're going to come and feed. And it's really a good opportunity to, to uh, get some whale shark shots. Are they're not the biggest the of whale angle? sharks. They're mm -hmm. typically 20, 25 feet, but uh, I've never known anybody to go to Oslob and not see more whale sharks than they could count. Marty, yes. this is L Linda. Hi, is Linda. the water actually that clear when you're it, snorkeling it, with them? It can be. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be. I've been there when the water was a little bit green, more green than blue. And I've mm -hmm. been there on days when it just had a, a astonishing visibility. So I guess my answer is it's the ocean. Are you taking, <laughs> the, are you taking those but, uh, shark pictures with wide angle lens? Say, say that again, please. Are you taking the shark pictures with a wide angle lens? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the whale sharks literally, they, they, it, the way it works, I don't know if you can see my, I guess you can see my hands, but they kind of line us all up in, and there'll be more than just us. All the tourist boats are kind of lined up and the fishermen just bring their boats right down the line and they're feeding the whale sharks right behind them. And the I whale see. sharks come down the line and, uh, Sometimes they turn away from you, but you you know if you're patient and you're just paying attention, you'll you'll get your opportunity. Yeah. We also do offer blackwater dives at night. Um, they're kind of a special thing. I think they're an additional charge, um, but it, it's just another way to kind of see the ocean, and it's very easy. It's a ten minute ride from uh, from the resort uh, to get to where we want to go, and that's it. This is a good, uh, this, I'm about halfway through, and this is a good time to stop for any other questions if, if there are at this moment. And if not, it's a good time to keep going. Um, so here's how, here's how the trip will hey, work. I've yes. got one question. Um, sure. Are there any sharks roaming with the whale sharks? Are there any other sharks? I've never, yeah. seen, I've never seen them. The only other sharks that I have seen uh, at Dumaguete have been uh, well, it's not true. I've seen white tip reef sharks and I've seen black tips, uh, black tip reef sharks over at Apo Island. Um, I wouldn't count on seeing them, but I definitely have. Uh, I have a question. It's sort of a, it, it's not, it's really a very night, you know, sort of super duper beginner question, but like when you're shooting at night, yep. Uh, is it the flash? Is it your flash that's illuminating the fish against the background? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So you would dive with my strategy typically at night is to dive with the dimmest light I can get away with. And sometimes I'll use a bright light until I see something. And then I try to use a dim light not to spook my core, my, whatever it is that I want to shoot. And I try to keep them in the kind of the periphery of my light. It's not always necessary, but that's kind of how I start uh, with a, with a dive light that's mounted to my camera system. Um, and it's mounted so I don't have to handhold it and, and also manipulate the controls on my camera system. 
but it's the strobe um, or a video light. If you're using a video light, uh, if you're shooting video that illuminates your subject. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so we got a couple more questions. Uh, okay. One is how would you characterize the resort? No frills or pretty nice? We're gonna get there and here's the thing. It is, uh, here's, I will say very nice. It's a diving, it's a, it's a self-contained dive oriented resort. So there are resorts where you go diving and maybe you do yoga or maybe there's a tennis court or something. We are diving centric and we are self-contained. You do not need to leave the resort for anything, uh, food, anything. Uh, and if I think in the next half of this presentation, you'll get a pretty good idea what the resort's like. I've got another, uh, oh, another two questions here. Um, so one is, would you use a red light or uh, just the white light on a low setting? It, it, would I use a red light? Yeah, I'm assuming that's- Yes, I, I often do. I don't always, but the light I've got has the option of uh, make where I can use it as a white beam that's brighter or a dimmer red beam. And just because there's crustaceans uh, and worms in the water, sometimes I'll use a red light. I like having that option. And we'll talk about doing a mandarin fish dive and I often use a red light for that. Uh, we offer a mandarin fish dive every night if for the, if Mike wants to go. Yeah. One more and then I'll move on if we can do that. Don't wanna yep. Uh, oh, uh, how many are signed up to, to go on the trip? I, I, don't, have, I don't have any idea. Uh, it's not not my part of it, but I hope all you guys are. Um, <laughs> I, I I can't help with that. Um, we I mean the trip doesn't start in July, so we don't have a final number yet. Um, but we are expecting to be about um, hopefully about eighteen to twenty uh, on this trip. So um, since um, is since I have I'm I'm speaking at the moment. I just want to let everyone know that we actually have a sale going on um, that ends tomorrow. So if you would like to join us on this trip, I would strongly advise you to get in touch with us right away so they can lock in the sale price. So how many people go on a typical dive? If you have 20 people out there, are, you, are, are 20 people getting in the water all at the same time? Or so here's, there, there's two ways we do it. On the boat that went out to Apo Island, you'll dive in different groups. So you've got dive master, you'll have a dive master with you on every dive. And the dive master, the ratio is typically six or eight uh, divers to one dive master. Okay. If we dive out of the skiffs, there will probably be six or seven or eight divers in a in one of the in the smaller boats. And they will go to typically to different dive sites so that we're not on top of each other. And That's when right. we go to Apo Island, we sta stagger the groups and kind of go, uh, you because of the current, you've kind of got to all go in the same direction, but we stagger them by, by time a little bit. Is that drift diving? Beg your pardon? Is that drift diving when you're going with the current? Well, it depends. It's not necessarily, but you can, over the course of the day, you may have some current that kind of takes you down the side of the island so that you're just, you're going to swim with the current rather than swim against it. Um, if, the, if there's too much current, we're, you know, it's hard to handle camera equipment. We're not going to dive that area. Hmm. Okay. Um, and I know you want to move to the next part, but I just uh, have two more quick things, which is, sure. um, are you planning on giving instruction, like photography instruction on blackwater diving? Um, and then do you expect a diver to have a lot of experience uh, to begin underwater photography? I, Mark, if you want to answer the experience question. Sure. But, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, and I'm glad that uh, that question was asked because uh, I often hear from people that, uh, you know, they're interested in doing a workshop, the idea appeals to them, but they feel like they might not know enough about photography yet, or it might be find themselves among a bunch, bunch of experts who don't want to talk to a beginner or something that it couldn't be further from the reality of it. Uh, these workshops are designed for everyone. And uh, so I want to highly encourage uh, people of all experience levels, from absolute beginners to the most experienced underwater photographers. Uh, I've been doing these workshops for a number of years, as has Marty. And um, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, in every case, uh, you know, people come away learning a substantial amount, even if they're already very knowledgeable shooters to begin with. And uh, by on the other side of the coin, uh, we, we while we don't want to 
talk down to anyone. We also don't skip the basics. We don't assume uh, that uh, that you already come into the workshop knowing a lot about underwater photography. So, um, and of course, it's always tough to teach any subject to uh, you know a varied experience or knowledge levels and so on. But that's one of the advantages of having the relatively small group that we do. Uh, we will have formal presentations where we cover the basics of a topic, but at any point we can also break off into smaller groups or there will be other occasions to work on a one-to-one -one basis uh, with Marty or myself. Uh, and we're always very happy to, to answer any questions. So you don't have to have prior experience, but uh, those who do, I think you'll find that uh, you end up building on that. And that is uh, largely due to the, the course material and hopefully due to our instruction as well. It's certainly our goal. But I also find that in these workshops, there's a real synergistic effect to it where uh, just being among other you know, motivated, enthusiastic underwater photographers in itself. Everyone uh, who's been shooting at all for any length of time uh, has learned certain tips and techniques and has secrets to share. And I find I learn from these workshops as well. And there's a very sharing uh, kind of a generous sort of atmosphere that prevails in these workshops. And it not only makes it uh, a better learning experience, but also more fun. And of course, you, know, you are, even though it is a workshop, uh, we don't forget that you're on holiday. And the idea is to to have fun as well as to uh, quickly ramp up your, your skills and um, knowledge. And, and just to clarify, I think the question was more about um, the diver's experience. So, uh, you know, if you're going in to start underwater photography, should you be an experienced diver? Uh, it certainly is is a plus. And uh, I would, to, to an extent, I'd say a prerequisite. Uh, it is it's very difficult to do good underwater photography if you're still struggling with basic diving skills. So um, it doesn't necessarily equate to a specific number of dives experience though. Um, I, I've seen people with you know hundreds or thousands of dives who uh, you know, have yet to master their buoyancy. And we've also seen people with uh, just fresh out of a certification class that are very comfortable in the water and deal with it well. So I don't think there's any magic number of dives that equals, you know, uh, uh, the the number uh, or the amount of experience, uh, uh, you know, necessary to do a, a workshop like this. But certainly, uh, having reasonable buoyancy control and, and general diving skills uh, is is a. a, a a plus and and to an extent a requirement, but uh, you don't need any special skills or uh, specialized experience. So, what's the typical water temperature in July in this part of the Philippines? You know, it, it will vary some, but I would say from the very high seventies to the mid eighties. One one of the things that there is a range, um, and goodness knows around the world, you know, climate change and temperatures fluctuate and whatever, but. The, one of the things that makes this area especially rich is it's it, there are currents that come through the channels between the resorts and the islands, and they obviously eddy and affect the, uh, so some of the island, the, the water where we dive, you'll get pools of warmer water or pools of cooler water. I can actually tell you that what, there was a time that I was diving, this was at Port of Galera, I guess, and it was, we had 80 degree water. We got up the next morning and I've never, I've only had this once. We had 68 degree water and thought, oh no, you know what the world's coming to an end. And by noon, the water was 78 degrees. And that does not, that had only happened that kind of like one time to me that it was that severe. But typically what I, what I typically do is bring a three millimeter suit and a hooded vest. Really? Yeah. I'm, I, I, I bring a hooded, I bring a hood for a lot of reasons. I don't like getting stung in the face and I don't like getting sunburned on the top of my head. Um, but I think that having a, on, on photography dives are sometimes a little bit slower dives. And if you make three a day in a night dive, I, I will get a little bit cool. So I bring a, I, I'm, you rarely hear people get out of the water and say I was too hot. So um, I, I'm always trying to, to stay a little bit warmer. No problem. Let me, I think maybe I should go on for a little bit and we'll pick up some questions again in a minute. Yeah, yeah, we can pick up some questions. Okay. So I was asked, I was asked about is, you know, what's the resort like? And so we'd like to think that the Atlantic's, the Atlantis experience makes a difference. So our crew is going to meet you at the airport in Dumaguete. We're going to pick you up and put you in a van and get your luggage. You're not going to have to lift anything. We're going to get you to the resort. We're going to give you some kind of frou-frou tropical drink and a massage, uh, just a brief welcome. You're going to have to do a little bit of paperwork. 
but we realize that people have traveled a long way. We have professional masseuses that that uh, ha that work at the spa um, that is there. Here's the the resort, and so the resort takes on the ambiance of its surroundings. It, we again are a self-contained diving dedicated resort, and uh, the area around the top up here are the rooms, and you see down to the. I guess we're up on the second floor here, and you can see kind of down to the ground floor. These are typical rooms. They're not the they're not the smallest, not the biggest, but you can see that there's plenty of amenities. There's a desk, there's bed, there's a bathroom that's separate from the main room. Uh, there's places for computers, and that's about how far you might be from the ocean. Um, if you're, you know, if you get a, a, a beachfront. Uh, residents. If not, you've got to walk for three minutes or to get to the water. This is the salon area. Um, we serve all, all your meals. Uh, you, we don't serve buffet style, uh, although there, there is that option, but you can order off a menu. Um, okay. So not everybody has to eat the same thing if you don't care to. There are choices the, the chefs uh, and the staff, they are culinary uh, trained. And uh, the, the, the dining is, what would you say, dining casual. Um, we ask people not to come into the restaurant in wetsuits and wet bathing suits, but you don't have to dress up. Nobody needs to bring any high heeled shoes or a dress or, uh, or a coat and tie. Uh, and maybe we wouldn't allow a tuxedo. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, and, and here's a, this has happened to be on Valentine's Day and we've used this, but every, every night we have a choice of like fish and chicken and meat. If you're a vegetarian, just tell us. If you need gluten-free, just tell us. And as long as we know in advance, we, the chefs will make all that happen. When I first got there, I thought it was kind of funny that we had a swimming pool next to the ocean. But if you dive pretty hard for three or four or five days, it's kind of nice sometimes to spend the afternoon up at the pool, maybe before a night dive. Um, so we do have a pool and a spa that is right next to the pool. And again, these are the masseuses or there's oh, th three or four masseuses that work at the spa. You can get a, a massage anytime from about nine o'clock in the morning till I think 10 o'clock, nine or 10 o'clock at night. And they offer a variety of, uh, uh, of services and massages. The uh, bar for those that care for an adult beverage is uh, kind of right on the beachfront. And uh, it's a nice place to wind down. And often we go there at night after a good diving day and, and talk photography. Um, I'm a little bit careful sometimes about bringing a computer down there because I don't want anybody to spill a drink on somebody's computer, especially mine. But, uh, but we often sit down and talk about what we saw and how we photographed and, and what we want to do the, the next day. The diving, uh, this is the dive shop, uh, the dive area. We dive nitrox. Uh, you don't have to. You can dive air. But just by the lay of the land, nitrox is a great gas to dive. We, our typical dives are no deeper than 80 feet, and we spend a lot of time in water that's between 25 and 60 feet. So nitrox gives us a lot of safety margin and extra bottom time. So we make long dives and there's nothing that says like be back on the boat in 45 minutes. It's just not how we function. The diving area where the dive locker, you can see there's little bins for mass fins and snorkel. You can hang up BCs and regulators and wetsuits and everybody gets assigned a number. So uh, you don't have to take your back to your room. Uh, right outside the dive locker, there's showers. So you can rinse everything and, and rinse buckets. You can rinse everything off, including cameras. And I think I want to say, yeah, including cameras, we have a dedicated camera room. And everybody that goes will have a little, a little cubby hole and a, a station for their cameras. I think you can see that around the rim of the camera room, there are electrical outlets for both 110 and 220. Uh, there's also some lights that uh, you can put in, in the camera room if you need one, and there's air hoses. We ask people not to go in wet. Um, one, there's electricity, and two, we don't mind about, want anyone to slip with camera gear. But uh, it's a dedicated room for, for cameras, so you don't have to take your cameras back to your room 
uh, the, this area is just is right by the salon. Mm -hmm. Secure, obviously. And we lock it up at night. Good question. You know, we lock it up at 10 o'clock at night. It's either, I think it's 10. And they open it up, the guards open it up at six o'clock in the morning. And it is right next to the office, which there's someone in the office all night long. Um, there's thorough dive briefings uh, before every dive. We've got about almost 40 dive sites within 15 minutes, uh, either direction of the resort. So there's definitely variety. And this is kind of the size of a group. Someone asked earlier, do we all dive together? If we go out in the smaller skiffs, this is kind of a dive master with a typical group. And you don't carry your gear, you can, but the dive masters will load the boats, change your tanks. You can take your camera gear to the boat or you can ask the dive masters to carry it to the boat. I typically carry my mass fins and snorkel. Uh, at, well, when I use a snorkel, um, I have a snorkel in my BC pocket. And this is about how far you've got to walk, depending on the tide. Sometimes you have to walk out a bit, but that's what one of the smaller boats looks like. And, and uh, uh, that's about how far off the beach you are. So we're going to go back to the diving real quick. Here's, here's the thing that makes our diving kind of, again, interesting is as soon as you anchor, you roll into the water, you start looking. This is these, this blenny with eggs was shot on a mooring line in about six feet of water. Mm -hmm. um we, the 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 lay of the land if you could see my hand is it's when you get in the water on a typical dive site there's kind of a flat area that goes depending on the tide from eight or ten feet down to about 15 or 17 feet and then it will start a gentle uh slope downward up on the top you often see animals like that blenny you'll see turtles feeding on gra on the seagrass these are a mating pair of seagrass wrasse that was shot up in the late afternoon up in the shallows. Um, and Mark, do you remember this fish? I sure do. I remember this you photographing a, that guy. A male snake blenny. It's the only one I've ever seen there, but it was up in that sand flat uh, right there just below the boat. Um, so you, you never quite know what you're going to see. And then you start down the slope and you'll see a variety of if you move too fast, again, if you go too fast, you won't see things. And you see, well, how can you miss this pipefish? It's just out in the open, but it's a big open area. And so you go slow. I usually try to get kind of downhill from my subject so that if I want to stop and photograph something, I don't kick debris or, or uh, on top of subjects, but just kind of an idea of what the, this, these animals are like. This is a male sand diver that's displaying. See sand divers a lot. They're really spectacularly colorful fish. You can't, all, and I can't certainly always get this close to them, but if you work at it a little bit on the slope, you'll generally get an opportunity to see these guys. And if you move too fast and if you're a little bit awkward, they'll bury in the sand. So it's a go slow, be patient, be patient with the animals, be patient with yourself. Everybody screws it up a little bit. Um, this is uh, a robust ghost pipe fish. Just some of the just some of the animals we may see. And I mentioned earlier, any place there's structure like this soft coral, you may see a seahorse or a cuttlefish or a pipe fish. And this just happens to be a thorny seahorse that's just uh, it's grabbed on. Another uh, pygmy pipe fish. It's, uh, I think it's called a short snout pygmy pipe fish. And it looks like it's smoking a cigar. It's actually <laughs> eating a little tube amphipod and uh, just happened to catch the behavior, which I just think is cool. And again, it's a, it's a go slow and be, the be patient part. A lot of times the guides will point at something. And if you pay attention to the briefings, you have a much better idea of what you might see, but you may not see what they're pointing at because you, don't understand the size to look for. And they'll often give you a clue of something's this big or it's this big. And it kind of helps you uh, to find subjects. Just I'll run through a couple of other animals. These are some of the snake eels that we often see uh, on the slopes. It's a, a reptilian snake eel on the top and Napoleon snake eel on the bottom. Little pe uh, frog fish that's feeding. And just that little bit of structure that's a little bit, you often find these animals just kind of tucked up against it. This guy's not the side, not as long as your little finger. Um, 
a white spotted puffer fish with a little squadron of juvenile jacks. And this, the puff, you see the puffers a lot. They feed in that soft bottom. And you can see kind of, he's got a little mustache around his lips where he's been kind of digging in the sand. And the jacks uh, who are there to get what they can get, the, the puffer uncovers. They are not there to share with anyone. And uh, it's kind of every man for himself, but uh, you'll see this kind of behavior uh, a lot of times. Then you'll change your habitat and it'll seem just, it's subtle, but you go from soft sand to kind of a more rubbly bottom. And there you may see uh, shrimp gobies and their partner, blind shrimp that share a burrow. Uh, jawfish, this is a yellow barred jawfish, yellow banded jawfish. And I always thought it should be orange, but it's, there are yellow bands on the body, yellow bars on the body. And this, this is a male, but it's a Mr. Mom. He's uh, uh, taking care of the eggs in, in his mouth, brooding the eggs. Oh, the little eyes. Say again? Oh, all right. And when not with eggs, this is just a male a, a jawfish that's just maintaining its burrow. So just an opportunity to see these guys. Another, this is a an anemone fish. It's a saddleback anemone fish on guarding the eggs uh, at the bottom of an anemone out in that rubbly area. A uh, flamboyant cuttlefish that's feeding. And obviously, I, I have been there more than one time. I, I love showing kind of the best of my, some of the best of my images. I won't promise anybody they'll see all these and have all these opportunities, but you're going to have a bunch of them um, on a typical trip. And uh, these guys, this is a striped, these are striped catfish. They are little bitty fish that can be from an inch to two or three inches, four inches long. Um, but you often see them in a, in a packed up in a little school that looks like they're rolling across the bottom. What are you shooting when you're shooting these? What, what, what lens are you using on these? Well, I, my go-to lens has been a 50 millimeter lens. Okay. Um, but it depends on the camera you're using and the size of the sensor. Uh, with a full frame sensor, I, I might shoot with 100. And then you vary because some animals you can get real close to. And some animals, you know, some opportunities you can't get as close. So, but a, but a 50 or a 100 millimeter lens or a 60 or a 100, 105 millimeter lens, a, a macro lens of some kind for sure. But it's not all about macro. Right. The reefs are spectacular, but it's really the opportunity to see all those different critters that I think makes Dumaguete special and makes the Philippines special. So in the reefs, and you'll go along areas where there's not much structure, all of a sudden there's a patch reef of some kind, and you see the creatures that you often see, like triple fin blennies and, and antheus that you see in reef communities. So you get a lot, it's not one ecosystem. And I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. We offer a Mandarin fish dive every night. I don't know who's had the opportunity to do a Mandarin fish dive, but you go in anywhere from about 12 to 18 or 20 feet of water. Mandarin fish uh, is right at sunset. And for about a 45 minute period, they'll come out and feed and, and hopefully mate. Um, and uh, they rise off the bottom about a foot. The guides will go with you, help get you in the right position. And then you got to be a little bit lucky, but you're certainly going to see an ander and fish, whether you get the shot, the, you know, you got to work at it or be a little bit lucky to get the mating shot, but the opportunity's there. This is an orange banded pipefish. It's a male that's uh, got eggs. Just a couple more behavioral shots and I'll wrap this thing up ring-tailed uh, cardinal fish. You see these guys a lot and they're surprisingly easy to get close to. You see them in a little school and if you get close, the school often kind of swims away. These guys will turn away and come right back where they were quite often, not always, it, but uh, it's surprisingly easy to have that opportunity. Lots of cleaning stations. It's hard to make me leave them. Um, and there's one site that's, that you ask, you know, what do you see? This is a site called Punta. It's the point. And I have been there on a dive and seen seven species of octopus. I've also been on trips where I only saw one species of octopus over the whole trip. And, you know, who knows, who knows why the octopus do. But uh, these are coconut octopus. 
Um, this is a, a wonder puss, and that's actually the exact same animal, just a, a minute or so apart. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, how do you pass this up? So a little wider lens is is gives you a better opportunity to photograph some of these octopus when they spread out a little bit. Um, but it's not the right lens to shoot a bug-eyed squat lobster with. So, and this, of course, is a, a poisonous uh, poison oscillate octopus. Motivi, as they're sometimes known by their genus name. And then this guy, which I wouldn't be surprised, Mark, if this was a dive we shared. This is a blue mm. ring octopus, um, which we, which sometimes when, when we see them, we tend to see a lot of them. And when we don't see them, we don't see them. But uh, we often do see them at Putin and at some other sites. So uh, I think I'm done. And uh, if anybody has a question now, I would take them and Take one. Uh, nope. Um, so we have a question here. Okay. Uh, are reef hooks used on any of the dives? Re no need. Uh, the question is, are reef hooks used? And we're, we're really not. Uh, it, 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 we're trying to avoid situations like that and to avoid strong currents. We're not trying to attract big animals uh, or go to areas where there's lots of big animals. So uh, I would not bring a reef hook. So I think I'm going to turn this over to Mark. Uh, Mark, anything else that you wanted to say about the, the workshop and the fact that we don't know all the answers and we're going to learn from each other and from everybody? Uh, yeah, well, thank, thanks, Marty. And uh, boy, that's a tough act to follow, Marty. So uh, that was so thorough and, uh, and uh, insightful. I don't know that I'm going to be able to add a whole lot. Uh, in terms of the destination or the resort, um, but maybe I can share just a few thoughts about uh, the workshop itself. And again, uh, this is uh, organized as a photo workshop, uh, but that doesn't mean that you're not on vacation. So participation, of course, is optional. No one's going to insist that you're there for every uh, session, uh, but uh, I, I think we all share a love for underwater photography or we wouldn't be here. Uh, so that, that certainly is the overall theme. And uh, again, the idea is to cover uh, really all uh, mainstream aspects of underwater photography. We're not going to have enough time to get too far into the weeds on any particular specialty uh, over the course of the seven days. But uh, being a macro-centric destination, uh, we certainly want to take good advantage of uh, the environment that we're working in there. I would say, uh, fair to say that the, the majority of the photo opportunities are macro or, or fish portraits and things like that. Uh, there will also be some excellent wide angle opportunities as Marty uh, mentioned and, and illustrated there in particular, uh, our trip to Apo Island. And for those uh, who want to do the, the whale shark experience, that's another great uh, opportunity for bigger animals and wider lenses. So for those who do have uh, multiple lenses and so on, by all means, do bring your, your wide angle stuff as well, but the, the main emphasis will be on, on critters and macro. Um, we, we do try to uh, make it a, a comprehensive look at underwater photography, again, starting with, with the basics uh, and then touching on each of the different main specialty areas, macro, wide angle. We'll talk about lighting, uh, and there will be plenty of time for hands-on experience as well. Uh, it's typically kind of a combination of classroom presentations, uh, as well as one-on-one -on -one sessions to whatever degree uh, you guys want and uh, as time is available, as well as, of course, plenty of time in the water. And uh, I, I don't believe in you know, removing dive opportunities to make more time for lectures and that sort of thing. We're there to dive, um, and there certainly will be plenty of opportunities. I think in terms of uh, you know, the, the structure of the, of the workshop, we will plan on uh, at least three dives a day, uh, but that certainly doesn't mean that you're limited to three dives a day. Um, if, if we were not doing a workshop, you could possibly squeeze in as many as four or five. Uh, I think that's probably not too realistic if you plan to participate in the workshop as well, but uh, there are options for night diving. And if you want a night dive every night, that's fine with us. And we're gonna try to keep the, uh, the instruction portion of the, the presentations and so on uh, limited to the daylight hours so as to not infringe on any opportunities for night diving. Um, but we will uh, cover one main topic each day in terms of the presentations, and those will be illustrated with photos uh, that were either taken at Dumaguete or very similar places to illustrate those techniques and equipment and so on. Um, and there will also be, uh, again, a chance for more informal sessions. Um, 
And we will also plan to do image reviews, not necessarily every day, but uh, several days uh, during the, the trip. Uh, the first day or two, we won't bother because most of us won't have images ready to, to uh, share at that point. Uh, but this is it's not meant to be a hardcore critique or anything like that. We're all among friends here. And it is, uh, it, again, it's all done in a very friendly, positive way. But I, I think any of us uh, can benefit from constructive criticism at times. So we'll have a chance to share images with others and uh, have a chance to comment on them uh, and remark about things that went well and things that, where there's possibly room for improvement as well. Uh, it's also a chance to, especially for those of you who don't have every gadget or a piece of underwater photo equipment that you might eventually want. It may be a chance to get familiar with some uh, uh, other types of equipment that you haven't tried before. Uh, in particular, we do uh, on these photo workshops, we bring a, a, a an extra uh, case of, of equipment, which is uh, generally intended as, if nothing else, for spares in case someone has uh, a problem with their equipment, that we will have some, some backup gear that's available. In some cases, uh, that, that may be available as a loaner. There is a limit to the amount of loaner equipment that we have, but we will also bring some new equipment that in case someone needs to replace you know, a fiber optic cable or a strobe or something like that, uh, that uh, these kind of things are, of course, in, pretty much impossible to find once you're there. Uh, you can't go to, uh, even in a big city, in most of these destinations like the Philippines and be able to buy that gear. So uh, we can't cover all contingencies, but we will try our best to uh, have uh, some, some spare equipment and uh, also uh, some types of uh, equipment that you may not have had a chance to play with before. And especially those that are well suited to a kind of a critter muck diving sort of macro uh, environment like this. Uh, in particular, uh, snoots, which uh, allows you to narrow down the beam of light from your strobe from a, a wide beam that most strobes are typically to a more narrow kind of a spotlight effect, which can uh, do a great job of kind of highlighting the subject and excluding uh, distracting backgrounds. Uh, there'll be a chance to uh, maybe try different uh, wet lenses, and those are lenses that can be added or removed during the dive, in particular wet macro lenses. And this will add a great deal of versatility to your diving and to your underwater photo experience uh, because it allows you to um, be able to photograph a, a wider variety of different subjects and different size subjects and so on on the same dive. Um, again, uh, the, the idea is to cover uh, as much as we can within the, the uh, allowable time, but still in a fun and casual way. Uh, but uh, uh, again, uh, aside from the formal presentations, uh, I can't emphasize enough the value of just being in the environment of a photo workshop like this, being among other underwater photographers who are there, hopefully to get more than just casual snapshots, but actually to learn about underwater photography and in improve their techniques and expand their knowledge and so on. Uh, I, typically, I find everyone comes away uh, having gained a great deal of knowledge and experience and, and again, having a lot of fun and coming away with uh, some great photos to show, show for it as well. Video? Do you do any video? Uh, videographers are certainly welcome. Uh, Marty uh, has a, a quite a background in, in uh, video. Uh, I do not. I've, I've shot video way back in the dark ages, uh, and uh, and I have some basic knowledge. But I will I'll have to defer to Marty in terms of uh, any of the technical side of that. Just to clarify that, I, I shot video when it was called film. <laughs> okay, that's really where my background. I, I should have said motion so, rather than video. So, well, how about I, ASA, I, man? How about your what ASA are you shooting? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, um, so I really I worked in the film business, but kind of when the transition was made to video, I went back to the stills world. And uh, so I am not I would not I am not an expert and I'm not up to date with equipment uh, that, that sport divers are using. I listen to the conversations, but uh, I, I don't want to over represent that. Mark, one of the things I also I thought we want that we should mention is. It, we want to help everybody have as good a time as, as you can have and learn as much as you can learn. And we're going to learn. Here's what we can't do is read your manual for you. And we really want you to be familiar with your gear before you get there. It's the thing that we try to do is balance everybody having fun and getting enough sleep and doing all the things they're doing. Everybody wants to do and not getting sucked down one area where we really get stuck trying to, to work with a, a particular person or a piece of equipment when we don't have the manual. So download a copy of your manuals 
put them on your computer. They're, they're, I always travel that way and would strongly su suggest that. Um, That's a great suggestion, Marty. Absolutely. Uh, very important to have owner's manuals, not only for your camera gear, but also please for your dive computers. Uh, you know, the, this equipment is so sophisticated these days. Nobody knows these these uh, items inside and out. Uh, I certainly don't. So uh, please do bring your, your manuals. What are the dates? What are the Tim, dates of the trip in July? Tim, I might uh, defer to you on that. I, I know about when it is, but I don't have the exact dates in front of me. Sorry. 27th uh, to 29th. Yeah, it's um, uh, the trip dates are July 22nd to the 29th. Um, so you can arrive in Dumaguete anytime on the twenty seventh, uh, on the twenty second, and you can leave Dumaguete anytime on the 29th. Okay. Um, and and I know I mentioned this earlier, but I do want to bring it up again for those of you who are interested. The trip is on sale. Uh, it's fifteen percent off, and the sale ends tomorrow. So uh, if you if you want to join uh, our trip, please uh, get in touch with us ASAP so you can you know take advantage of the sale that ends tomorrow. Tim, two two things I might add to that: is there not an option to extend for three days? Or did that happen? Yes. So there is an option um, for any of you that want to uh, stay longer since you're flying all the way there. Um, you can stay for an ad additional three nights at Atlantis at a reduced rate. Um, we also have a bunch of different um, uh, extensions that you can do, uh, especially to Porto Galera as well, uh, to Atlantis in Porto Galera, also at, at a reduced rate. So, you know, if seven days is too short for you, you can easily spend 10 nights or even two weeks in the Philippines. And Porto Galera, I mean, I'm sure Marty can tell you has excellent diving as well. Yeah, it's it's sim it's different than Dumaguete, but it's similar. And um, I don't really have one that's that I prefer. I, I also had a had a question from Natasha, which was, um, uh, how would you compare Dumaguete to Anilau? Uh Never dived Anilau, Uh but it's the same part of the world. And I, look, look, I mean, if you're saying the the shops there do a great job, I don't have anything bad to say about those guys. Um, and I think we try to offer the best service that we can. And, and I think the diving is the, the diving in the Philippines. So I've dove the Bandu Sea and Raja Amphat and um, similar to that. You know, I, similar. Yes, and different. I mean, it, yeah. it's the, the, I think of Raja as being lots of wide, a lot more wide angle opportunities with big animals, yeah. probably not as much uh, kind of guaranteed encounters with the world of the bazaar. Um, certainly they have them and you see them. Um, uh, and then again, we've got offered the opportunity to like to go do the whale shark dive. Um, so you know, it's, it's similar in that, that there's an awful lot to shoot in both areas. I don't, I, I have a hard time comparing sites and, and uh, yeah, I couldn't do it either. Yeah. I, I think uh, it, it is fair to say that the, the biodiversity is on a similar scale. There might be, you know, a handful more species one place than the other, but in general, you know, the, the Philippines and Dumaguete are very solidly within that coral triangle epicenter of bio, marine biodiversity. And in that respect, uh, I think you'd have a very hard time saying whether you, you know, saw more different species in Racha Ampat versus Dumaguete. They're both fabulous in that regards, but quite different in other ways, as Marty was saying. Right. Anybody else? Anything else? Um, there was a question by Robin. Um, I, I just wanted to bring it up. Um, she asked if... Um, if the deposit is re is refundable because she would like to check if she can actually make those dates, um, I told her that as long as she gets in touch with us by tomorrow um, and lets us know that you attended this presentation, we will hold the sale price for you for a few days while you check your work schedule, your vacation time, check with your significant other if he or she can go with you. So as long as you send us an email by tomorrow, we will hold the sale price for you for a few extra days. 
And by the way, uh, something that may not apply to uh, this group, but um, even though this is, of course, you know, I, an underwater photography centric trip and uh, certainly diving oriented, uh, if anyone has a friend or spouse, significant other who is perhaps not as keen a diver as you are or not into underwater photography, that does not mean that they would necessarily not enjoy uh, a trip like this. Um, uh, again, it's a lovely resort, a beautiful natural area and some fabulous diving for however much or little diving someone might want to do. But uh, I, I'm sure that uh, I, I never uh, make time to do things like relax by the pool and that sort of you know, typical resort sort of uh, activities when I'm on these trips. But for someone who values that kind of stuff, uh, I think it could also make for a very well-rounded vacation for someone who's not necessarily uh, you know, full on into the diving and underwater photography. Um, awesome. So uh, are there any final questions? I don't see any final ones on Facebook. And uh, I, I just want to say that it's because of a video I watched of Efren's that I bought that 100 millimeter Canon lens and I haven't used it yet, Efren. And I'm just, you better be right about it focusing automatically. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> There's something going on here. I will tell you, I use a Canon 100 a lot of times, but I don't want to get in the middle of this discussion. So I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm just going to say I find a good I find a good use for mine. I, yeah, I, can't. I have a question. I have a question. This is Teresa Beck. Um, I'm single, and if I want to share a room with somebody, do you offer uh, looking for somebody that wants to share a room? Um, yes, so uh, if you're traveling as a single and if you would like to share a room, we can pair you up with another diver. So you do not have to pay the single room rate if you don't want to. Thank you. Uh, this is a question, but uh, it's not, it's our, our, uh, uh, Mark and Marty, are you guys also doing the 2025 Raja Ampat? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, I would be the first to uh, to sign up. <laughs> to, oh. if yeah. I, were I think we should go ahead and accept, and we say thank you for that invitation. And if you send us some details, we'd uh, we'd love to to join. I, I don't know anything about it either. This is uh, okay. We're we're uh, we're doing this one and, and happy to do it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's. Uh, because I, you know, I just when when I got I got an email from Blue Water with a lot of a lot of different opportunities on there, and so I I and I I thought uh, that perhaps you guys were doing that one too. I just dropped him a note and tell him to, hold, <laughs> to think about it for a few days. Yeah, maybe we'll put a bug in Tim's ear. <laughs> <laughs> Should we say thanks all? I think so. I think yeah. I think that covered everything. So. Thanks everyone for joining. That was awesome, Marty. I really appreciate the presentation. Thank, thank you. you very much. Everybody July. Thank Great. you very much. Are you sending thank out a link? Much. Are you sending out a link to uh, reserve for this to the people that were on this video? Yeah, yeah, we'll send out a link to everybody. Okay, yeah. great. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you guys. Thank you very much. We really appreciate right. you joining us and hope to see you in the Philippines. Bye, Bye, Lisa. Bye, Bye Tiger. Bye. Bye, Winnie. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>